So I'd like to begin by knowing how many of you are problem solvers? All right, I'm in the right place, good. And how many of you have thought about using patterns in nature to solve those very problems? Like observing beavers for water management or squirrels for food systems? Not as many, right? <laughs> this concept called permaculture will become clear in just a moment. As a permaculture teacher and designer, the squirrels, the beavers, and even the trees are amongst my greatest mentors. Permaculture is a culmination of two words, permanent and agriculture. It's an ecological design science that's rooted in the observation of nature to design solutions for the environmental and social challenges that we face. I know it sounds quite vast, but it's actually very simple at its core. My journey with permaculture began just after university when a friend of mine asked me for advice on planting date palms in the Jordan Desert. Now, I know why she came to me. I'm the eco friend of our group, always knowing what to compost and inviting people over for clothing swaps. But in this very moment, I realized I didn't have the skills to design solutions for her, let alone for all the problems we learned about in university. So what was I to do in this moment of panic? Okay. I just ask Uncle Google. It's probably what many of you would do. <laughs> In moments, I discovered the Greening the Desert Project by Jeff Lawton. It's 10 acres of desert flat in the Jordan Dead Sea Valley, hyper-arid, over-salted land that he made fertile once again. This place is known to be the Fertile Crescent, after all. What was interesting was this permaculture design process. So first, we observe the situation. In this case, we're observing the desert. We state our goal, we design a solution, we evaluate and repeat. So if we observe the desert, we notice there's a few key elements missing for an ecosystem to thrive. One being moisture, the other being organic matter. These are also known as water and leaves. Now what Jeff did was he shaped the land to catch the rainfall. He brought in waste leaves from nearby, and within months, there was a mushroom that began eating the organic matter and actually capturing the salt from the soil. This effectively remediated the whole situation. What Jeff did was something that is not considered appropriate in conventional agriculture. We normally just abandon these oversalted farms. But what Jeff did in the end was like putting a defibrillator on the heart of this ecosystem, and it awoke. This simple Google search changed my life entirely. For the past seven years, I've discovered through permaculture how to heal communities, how to feed the hungry. And I've even seen solutions so great that they can fight against climate change. This led me to become a permaculture teacher, designer, and now founder of P3 Permaculture, which is a design consultancy and school, where hundreds of our students have gone across the world now starting their own projects, just like Jeff. What's really interesting is the moments of inspiration in their eyes the projects that they go on to begin. Even today, a group of our own students from this year are creating a design cooperative to create solutions for problems right here in Montreal. So let's get back to the design process. Permaculture, right? So we need to state a goal or solve a problem. Can anyone think of a problem they might need to solve? There's quite a few, I know. But if you don't know what your problems are, trust me, you are worse off. So let's start with a problem. Then we observe, design a solution, evaluate, and repeat. And this process is quite simple. But around the world today, there are nations, governments, and whole communities that fight against problems that are insurmountable with the conventional approach to problem solving. So let's use permaculture to solve these problems. One such problem is growing food in the desert. But another problem is actually food deserts themselves, which aren't actually deserts, but areas of the world where inhabitants have low access to food, urban, rural, and beyond. This is a common problem that is usually remedied by governments bringing in supermarket chains to these already marginalized areas. Now, we don't need more pre-roasted takeout chickens or canned ravioli. What we need is good, nutritious food. And so if we observe this same ecosystem where we thrive in food deserts, there are other groups of species that thrive alongside us in abundance. And one such species is the squirrel. I know, I know, they're not considered our best friends, fighting, tearing down the bird feeder and fighting the kids for their lunch snack and stealing my tomatoes. 
But how do they do so well for themselves? If we observe the ecosystem, we notice that squirrels are continually gathering nuts, seeds, your tomatoes. But what's interesting is that only 15% of the food that they gather is consumed. This means that 85% of the nuts that they gather are simply wasted. Now, if this was a conventional grocery store chain, they'd just throw out the old nuts when the new ones come in. But the squirrels, they put their, nut, they put their walnuts in the dirt. And if only one of those walnuts was to grow into a tree, that walnut tree would produce 50 bushels of walnuts every year for 150 years. That's six pickup trucks worth of nuts every year. It's more than the squirrel or its kids will ever need for the rest of their lives. That's a good sustainable system, right? Actually, that's beyond sustainable. If I said that my relationship to my mother was sustainable, she might have something to say to me after this talk. <laughs> Sustainability is bare minimum, and we need to see it as only the first rung in the ladder towards abundance, and design systems that are really abundant, just like our friends the squirrels. The squirrels are shaping forests and parks every day into systems that produce not enough food, but an abundance of food, more than they'll ever need. That's the model that we need to mimic. So let's change perspective and look at how we can shape our forests using this knowledge of the squirrely wisdom to change the way that we grow food in our communities. If we look at the forest systems, we can start to see different layers of growth. We start to see different systems interacting. And if we observe this and start to place elements or edible plants in the mix, and we create an integrated orchard, we start to create what's called the food forest in permaculture. This is a very known concept that we use in permaculture as a design. Imagine an apple tree that's got bushes, shrubs, vines, flowers, and everything else it needs around it to thrive. This system is auto-fertilized, auto-irrigated, and self-maintained. So we can take this and start transitioning our parks and our forests to be edible landscapes, and that's an abundant system. This technique is not new at all, and we see it all around the world. In fact, indigenous peoples have been transforming landscapes into permaculture paradises of food forests for thousands of years. In fact, as my teacher Jeff discovered in Morocco, there's one that exists for more than 2,000 years. We see these now popping up in Detroit, Seattle, Borneo, all around the world. And they're from one tree to 1,000 hectares. This is an abundant, scalable solution that we can use to design our problems for our food crisis. Who would have thought the answer to our food systems lies with the squirrels? How would we normally problem solve? We look to technology, we research in a lab, ask Uncle Google. All the while, there's 4.6 billion years of research and development that lies beneath our feet unused. And with this knowledge, we can design solutions for the world. As the late Bill Mollison said, co-founder of the permaculture movement, though the problems of the world are increasingly complex, the solutions are embarrassingly simple. And with permaculture, together, we can design solutions worth sharing.